Welcome to GMI Hub Online. This is Cheryl and Dale, of course. Hey, and we are so glad that you are here with us as we are going to be talking about crafting your songs. Now, many of us write songs and not, I don't know how many of you, but I know for myself, I have very basic rudiment understanding of music and me too at the same time. Yeah, it's not. It's right there. Anyway, <laughs> so, um, so we are going to be talking about. <laughs> watch me. Just okay, watch sorry. me. <laughs> Talk to the people over okay, there. Okay, hi there. How are you? <laughs> so, um, um, so we are going to be talking about now that we're going to be serious about about understanding the basics of how to build your song. So there are many of you that are watching. I've heard many of you say you have songs and you don't know what to do with them. You may not even know what you have already done with your songs. So I'm hoping tonight that as we talk about this, it'll kind of open your eyes and also open your creativity because you'll understand a little bit more about how songs work, how the rudiments work and cording and all that stuff works. And, and your creativity level of creating music will just go like big. Mm -hmm. I'm so thrilled to have, we have, we have two wonderful panels that are here, but before I do that, I'll introduce Dale. Okay. Hi there. <laughs> hey, thank you for watching. If this is your first time watching us on YouTube or uh, if you're on Facebook, that's great. Make sure you go into our YouTube channel and, and subscribe there and put the notification bell, click that. So you'll get a notification the next time we put a video up and show us some support by going on there. It really means a lot to us. If you, um, if you, you know, like it and drop drop a comment. We'd love to hear from you. But I want you to let, let you more know more about. I think my tongue's tied here. But I want to try and get you to, to to get to know you better. And how we do that is through our website, gmihub.ca. If you go into the connect with us and drop us an email, let us know if you're an artist, musician, and are uh, you're doing something in the industry, or or you want to get plugged into what we're doing. Let us know. We would love to hear from you. Uh, we want to connect with you if you're an artist, if you're a producer, if you're a, an engineer. And we'll, we'll, relationships are really important, and we want just to be part of your journey. And we want to help. We really do. That's all we really want to do. So uh, get into the connect section on gmihub.ca and send us an email today. And, you know, once a month we send out a uh, hub happening. It's a great little notification email you'll get once a month. Mm -hmm. it's uh it tells you what we're up to it tells you what's happening and it would be good for you to have something that's happening maybe in your music if you've got a, a performance coming up or if you've got a uh, a song that you're releasing or a project that's coming out or an event you've got planned let us know about it and we'll put it in our hub happenings if you give us permission to do so and we can help promote what you're doing because it really it's all about us helping you that's so right. that would be something that we would just appreciate you guys taking advantage of that's right that's right also, when you go to GMI Hub online, there is now a new page. GMIHub.ca? Not only that, the support page. Oh, yes, this is really important. Yes, yes we have a true. support page. Now, many people have been asking us, how can you support GMI Hub? How can we support you guys? Because we like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so we have created a page, GMI Hub support, GMI Hub page, pretty much on our website, GMIHub.ca, which will list the various ways um, in which you can support what we are doing. Um, there's everything from helping us financially to praying with us to just plainly connecting with us mm -hmm. and 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 talking with us. Like get get connected with us and let us know what are the things that you are looking for to to help build your music mm -hmm. career and. Um, just go ahead and visit that page. That's gmihub.ca and go to the support GMI hub page and you will see the whole list there. And we would love to connect with you. Mm -hmm. And we thank you in advance for, for connecting with us and for your support. Great. And today we're going to delve into crafting. I can't wait because this, we're called artists for a reason. And, mm -hmm. and when you look at uh, artistry, there's a, there's a craft to it. There's a certain techniques that you can learn and ways that you can move and we're going to do some talking about crafting your music today that's right so with us it's not just going to be dale and i talking <laughs> it's going to be two other panelists that are with us and they are returning panelists uh one to my right is anthony piano on the piano <laughs> anthony is a producer he's the producer and music arranger at exodus Studio Productions, or I think I said they're on Exodus Production Studios. Yes, that one. Studio, Studio Production. Right, I got it right the first, first time. time right. Okay, it's Exodus, that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, and he was also the producer of my Christmas song that I just did. So, welcome, Anthony. 
piano. Thank you so much for being here. Yes. And to my left or to the left of Dale is Jonathan Rowe. Jonathan is a worship leader, but he is also a musician, a music arranger, and a few other things too. <laughs> and we are so thrilled to have Jonathan come back and share his musical talent. So thank you, Jonathan. Absolutely excited to be here. Yes. Great. Wonderful. Guys. So guys, now we've brought the experts in. Mm. Let's talk music <laughs> and let's talk the basics now i'm going to use myself as an example i only have grade one music understanding so there are many people that may have more of that but let's talk about some rudiments that what are some rudiments that songwriters should know when it comes to even beginning to craft a song or crafting a melody yeah, where do we start where do we start yeah, yeah. Who goes first? yeah any mini money mo <laughs> let's go anthony then john, john can go <laughs> alphabetical order anthony. well i think uh first and foremost um uh, singers songwriters um that i deal with i think having a knowledge base of an instrument to start with mm -hmm. even before you can start applying scales and chords and theory you know having a, a even if it's a little bit of of a, a, a limited knowledge of let's say piano or a keyboard or a guitar um, that's a that's a starting point because it's going to allow you to be able to write your your lyrics and melody to an actual um, to a harmony right so I think uh, that is a good starting point and it's not always the case I deal with a lot of a lot of singers songwriters that don't have a knowledge base of an instrument. They just have a, a melody that they came up with, and now they need to put that melody into a, a song. And so that's where, you know, we come in mm -hmm. the, the picture that uh, because of our experience and uh, on recording, knowing scales, theory, and how to apply that melody, because everything starts with the melody. Mm -hmm. right. A song without a melody, you don't really have a song, right? So mm -hmm. that is the starting point. And then after that, then we start adding to it. Right. So Okay, so so first thing is have an understanding of an instrument, right? It's not always the case. I mean, there's there's a lot of people that don't, right? Mm -hmm. And they've written some great songs, uh, but they've had to rely on, on, on uh, somebody like myself. Um, Having a basic knowledge of chording, mm -hmm. if it's just playing some, you know, basic chords, one, four, five, uh, you know, really simple, just to add to their melody. Right. And it's it's a good starting point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it's not always the case, but mm -hmm. uh, it's encouraged to do so. Just yeah. back up for a second. You said one, four, five. Let's do an example of what that means. Hit okay. the one, four, five, so we can understand what that sounds like. Right. So if we're, let's say, there are obviously different keys that a song um, that a song could be written in, but let's just say, let's take the key of C, all right, which is basically no flats, no sharps. Um, so a one, four, five would mean C, that's one, D, E, E, F is four, and then the G would be the fifth, right? So it'd be one. Awesome. Very awesome. basic, right? Right. Yeah. Jonathan, what's your opinion on on what uh, what um, where does a person start with yeah, their songs? With what's well, your opinion on that? Well, to complement what he's saying, so you know, if, if we're going to provide two things that are going to be helpful for somebody, the first one is you know you can learning how to play on an instrument of some kind, just so that you have something to articulate your your melody on that you can get feedback from or while you can work on other things in your mind like lyrically or melodically while you're doing that but then the second thing that i would say is really good for new people to do is just listen to as much music and as a variety of different types of music as you can get your hands on if you're allowed to listen to music while you're at work put your headphone in if it's safe to do so and just listen to different things uh Spotify has a feature where you play a song and then you hit a button and then it'll just pull up different things that it thinks you're going to like. 
do that one day for some music that you really like and then another day pick some music that you don't like as much and see what pops up just so you can start it's like learning language by immersion mm. the best way to learn a new language is to place yourself in an environment where you have to learn the language and the only way to do that is to place yourself in an environment where you remove your natural language. Well, if you place yourself in an environment where you're listening to different types of music constantly, those things are always going to be ready to reference in your mind. And then the main skill set you're going to want to work on is, and this is going to be the key, the number one thing that I think that you can do is, and this is where the instrument comes in, is to learn how to take what you're hearing, either in your own mind or what you're listening to, and to put that in a form that you can replicate for yourself. So if he were to play some, like, and we've spent lots of time as professional musicians learning how to do this. If he were to play something, I can't see what he's playing. I don't know what he's playing, but I can hear it and then I can play it back. Mm -hmm. As soon as you're able to do that, you've, that's, you've just opened a wide gate for what's available to you from a songwriting perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I can add to that, mm -hmm. that's yeah. a good point as far as listening to other music, because I think we're all influenced by something we've already heard. And so if you're writing a song, there's a good chance that you're writing it from that perspective. Something's going on that's influencing you in, in some direction of what you've written. And, and so if the more music you have and that you've been uh, listening to, then you have more uh, references mm -hmm. so for instance a lot of songwriters that i work with you know they'll come up to um we'll meet up and, and they got this song they have a melody not a lot and and i asked them well okay what direction is the song going to go into because you know it can go into so many directions right mm -hmm. um so uh, the best way for me to communicate uh, how we can communicate is by providing me some references, some mm -hmm. other songs that they listen to. There's a good chance that, that the song they just wrote, there's an influence there, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, and if they provide me a few tunes that they listen to and they can tell me, oh, this is sort of the direction that I want my song to go into. Mm -hmm. And that so this is a good starting point. So, you know, having, uh, basically, basically what you said, mm -hmm. you know, having a, a, a large uh, repertoire mm -hmm. of songs and music that you listen to that will influence the direction of an original song that you mm -hmm. just wrote, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So as you gentlemen were speaking, the, one of the thoughts that came to my mind with regards to understanding the instrument side was... I don't know if everybody has access to an instrument. You gentlemen are using keyboards. So, so, so tonight we're gonna to be basing this on keyboards. Um, and uh, I know for myself, I went back to uh, the sound of music and do a dear, a female dear, yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of idea. And yeah. the reason I'm bringing that up is rudimentary, the, the scales, it led up to, that's, that's what came to my mind sure. as well. Vocally, if someone doesn't have access to a piano or another instrument that can help them, that's probably the next best thing is understanding the scales. Now, the do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, mm -hmm. I think is is that the major scale? Is that right? That would be an example of a major scale. Yes. Yes, that would be an example of a major scale. So, um, um, and for those, again, if you need to understand that. Think of Sound of Music, think of the song, Doe a Deer, a Female Deer, and it goes on. Yeah. Um, that is the example of a major scale, a basic scale, but there are other scales as well, sure. which are just basic. Um, in terms of having access to an instrument, if you don't have a keyboard at home, the easiest thing that you can do is just pop on your favorite search engine of choice and type in virtual piano. And what will happen is you'll get a bunch of different pages and you know, just pick, pick one near the top. And what will happen is you'll get a, a visual representation of, of a keyboard. And you'll see a bunch of white and black keys. And if you click on the notes, you'll be able to hear. Okay. You know, that might not allow you to, let's say, play a bunch of different notes at the same time. But if you're working on the melody portion of your song, that'll certainly let you hit out notes in succession. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're talking about a scale, we're talking about a series of notes in six you know in progression with each other that go from one note to what we call an octave above or the same note either you know a bit higher 
Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get too technical, but mm -hmm. just let's just say that. Now, in music, and when I when I from now on when I say music, I'm talking about Western art music. Right. We're going to assume that most of the listeners that are listening today are going to be listening from a perspective of writing out of a Western history of music, and mm -hmm. therefore we're going to leave other things out. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the basic building block of Western music when it comes to scales is something we call the tone or a whole tone if you're feeling particularly classical, which is where you look at your you know, keyboard and you'll pick, let's say, the note C, which will be this note, and then you're going to skip over the black key and then go to the next note and you've got these two notes together, that's tone, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you play the white and the black key together, we'll call that either a half tone if you're interested in jazz or a semitone if you're interested in classical and that'll sound a little bit different it doesn't sound quite that good when i play them together but if we're talking about a major scale what we're talking about is creating a series of notes that goes from the note a tone a tone a semitone a, and then another tone 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 semitone or half tone mm -hmm. And if you have difficulty remember that, what I like to tell people is you pick up the phone and go tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone, three, four. Oh. Uh, that is the major scale. That is the scale from which the majority of Western music is derived. Mm -hmm. And there are different scales that you can pick. For example, you could take this scale and you can start on any one of those seven notes and play through. You know, I could start on E, for example, and it'll sound very different. But that's another example of a scale. The two most important ones are the ones that start on C, which is our major scale. Or you can start on A. Oh, by the way, before I do that, just to illustrate the numbers that he was talking about, is if I start on C and I treat that as one, then if I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, That'll give you my seven notes. So when he was saying one, four, five, I was playing the chord with those notes based on one, based on four, and based on five. And the reason that we use numbers is because then it doesn't matter which note we start on if we're building on the basis of the major scale, mm -hmm. as long as we know what note we're starting on. So if I'm starting here, which is A flat, then I can go and I can pick one, four or five without having to think about what letter goes where mm -hmm. now just to quickly wrap up my point i started on one got my major scale mm -hmm. now if i start on six and go up that'll give me what we call the natural minor mm -hmm. so the major scale and the minor scale are the two different types of scales that you're going to get 99 percent of your music from now I can do two different things to that. I can go up and I can take that seventh note and I can raise it and I get a nice little harmonic feel to it. And we'll call that a harmonic minor. And that's used for songs that are mostly set in a minor key or coming from a jazz perspective. If I go up and I'm doing a melody, I'll raise that six and seven on the way up, but then I'll bring it back to normal on the way down, we'll call that a melodic minor. If you know those four scales, that's going to set you for 99% of whatever you want to do Ooh. as a starting point for knowledge of scales. If anything you wanted to, to add or build on? Yeah, just, uh, just to add to the um, um, learning the instrument thing, right, is that I think for a lot of people that might be a little daunting, you know, to, to learn how to play an instrument. Uh, but if you're very serious about pursuing um this um songwriter's uh, world i think it's worth the investment of a little bit of time and you don't have to be super proficient at it you just want some basic so just very basic structure and you don't have to be a, a technically great you just need to know where the notes are um you, you can use the um the digit the um uh the online thing i just find the it's to me, it's more practical to be able to touch touch the actual instrument. And a keyboard or piano is great because everything is just all laid out. A guitar, a little bit more challenging. A piano or a keyboard, it's all laid out. You can see everything. Um, it's a lot easier to to go forward. Um, yeah, and in terms of 
the the basic structure of the scale that each scale also has chords that go with it right mm -hmm. so for instance we were talking about the major scale right mm -hmm. all right um now if you're writing a song there's a good chance that you might want to go into a different scale or a different key per se because it, it will depend a lot on the range of your vocals if that's your you know if you're writing a song you you, you can't always work with one scale you you or key let's just say um in western music you know we have uh sharps and flats and uh are we getting too technical with that one <laughs> right sharps and flats and uh and depending on the the key that you're singing in or the the scale that you're going to be using it will be dependent on the key uh, that be depending mostly on the range of your vocals mm -hmm. because that will dictate the key the key that we're going to uh, write the song and compose the song, arrange it. But let's just say we're in the key of C. So if you've got your major scale, right? So that's a, a C major scale. Now with that, there's um, there's chords that go with it. And the term that we'll use is it's called diatonic, right? Which is basically you're staying within that um, scale. You're not going to deviate. You're not going to go into you know, modes, which are all different types of scales. Um, but we're going to stick mostly to the, the diatonic approach, which would mean that if, if we have a scale of C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, and C is the root, root implying that it's the first note of the scale, then if you were to put a chord on top of that note, you would do this, a three note implying diatonic. So you got a that's a C major. That's the, the that's uh, that would be the, the first chord. The next chord, if the root now becomes the D, is D minor. Then we got E minor with E being the, the root. Then we got F, G, A minor, B diminished, and then back to C. So a very simplistic approach here. All I did was just you know I, I don't even have to move my hand much. Mm -hmm. Just keep it in that same position and just go up. And those are pretty much all the chords that would fall into that C major scale that are within the diatonic approach. Very simplistic. And so if you're writing a song and you're and you've got a melody, you can easily work with those those chords, right? By I'll just I'll just make something up here. Oh, it's a little melody. So I went to a G now. So very simple, and all I did was use the, the C major scale, which is all the white notes, and the chords that work within that scale. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I'm learning a lot already. I think I actually <laughs> learned something too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so there's four scales, four scales. So there's major scales. There, I'm just reviewing. Yeah. There's minor scales. There's harmonic scales, and harmonic minor, harmonic minor, yeah. and there was a fourth one, and melodic minor, and melodic. There, there's a lot more scales than those four, mm -hmm. but those four, if you learn those, yeah, and they're they're the, they're fairly easy to learn because they're all connected to each other. Mm -hmm. if you can deal with yeah. those four; that will take you most everywhere you want to go from like from a beginner to intermediate perspective you can work within those and write very very good many of the popular songs that you love and listen to are based solely on the structure that we just presented it's interesting when you were playing the scales one of you were playing the scales and i automatically started hearing almost like phantom of the opera like just based on the scale that you mm -hmm. played and it, and it was it was almost like oh so that's how they built that they like it sounded like a complicated song when i first heard it but i think it's just i know a, the exact song out of that yeah. particular musical that you're listening to unfortunately i'm not allowed to play it back to yeah, you yes <laughs> but right i can play up to six notes of it yeah <laughs> <laughs> but but it almost like i know you were just displaying the scale but based on that scale yeah. i could i could hear that scale being the building block of that particular song absolutely right so perfect example right and i and you know i sit i sit there and think of 
you know, even simple, some simple songs like Mary Had a Little Lamb is probably based on one of the major scales or something like that. That's a public domain song, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so uh, why don't we use that, right? Yeah. So <laughs> you have this note, you know, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Just take, you have, let's go back to C major. Mm-hmm. All they're doing is just like. That. He's courting. He's not. Yeah. Saying, yeah. <laughs> All of all of the melody notes are contained within the scale, mm-hmm. and all of the chords that he played, mm-hmm. that he chose to play for this particular arrangement. And mm-hmm. when I say arrangement, mm-hmm. I'm talking about a sequence of chords that is set to a melody. Mm-hmm. Were based on what we call triads or three notes, and how you build those chords. You just take the first note. You take, for example, C. You skip the next note of the scale, and then go to the third one. Mm-hmm. Then you skip the next note of the scale after that. And you go to the fifth one mm-hmm. and we call that a triad tri meaning three and then you just as he was doing mm-hmm. you're just picking that then you could go you know and you can play different chords so you can go like yeah pick pick some chords mm-hmm. so something as simple as that went to like so what chords did you do that was so different like that was like so what he did and here's so (laughs) to illustrate the example i don't i can't see what he played but i can translate the sound of what he played into musical vocabulary Mm -hmm. so what he ended up sounded something what he ended up doing was what i would call walking down as he went down you know then he threw in a note outside of the scale because he wanted to be fun (laughs) <laughs> and then so we'll, we'll ignore that one confuse, for a moment and then back to one yeah <laughs> right and so just you know and even you know you could you don't even the first chord doesn't have to be a one so if i'm going like mary mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. now i played that song it was in the key of c but i never played a c chord right so there's lots of variety. You're a rebel. Yeah. You're a rebel. <laughs> so yeah, well, um, just to add to that, um, the more the more um, chords you know, it, it's kind of like a, a painter, right? A painter, mm. he's painting a picture. The more colors he has on his palette, mm-hmm. then he's got more to work with, right? Mm-hmm. And so all we're saying here is having the knowledge base uh, adds to the to the to complete this this well, masterpiece we have to learn theory and rudiments oh man well we just don't <laughs> call it that oh okay okay <laughs> tools. all right so we call them tools tools there we go all right i like so, that better so having having the uh the, the knowledge base and of course there's you can there's so much to explore right within this context but you know we're trying to keep it uh, simplistic but even on that even on the, the simplistic uh, level you just having that at your disposal yeah. just mm-hmm. gives you more to work with right more tools in your tool more belt tools yeah. And, yeah. And, and, yeah and you develop right you develop you mm. start learning that okay well maybe I we call them substitutions <clears throat> so basically you, you start to deviate so instead mm. of you know being staying in the diatonic domain which is just a simple then you can start going you know we start deviating by the tectonic or whatever by using yeah by by using substitution substitution. which makes you know that adds to that melody Mm -hmm. and it still fits but it's but it's not necessarily in the diatonic domain right in other words for it's instance, wrong, in the key of, well, for instance, in the key <laughs> of C, <clears throat> you know um, what we talked about—the diatonic, which was was all white notes, right? C, D minor, E minor, F, G, A minor, B diminished, and C. Those are all within the, the scale of C, mm-hmm. right? Now, and the melody will, would fit on t- would would be sitting on top while these chords are um, sustaining or um, supporting that melody Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now the more you learn that you start realizing oh i could use a another chord that's actually not 
in the diatonic domain. In other words, it's not all the white notes per se mm -hmm. in the key of C, mm -hmm. right? And and that's what makes that's what adds more color to uh, to the arrangement mm -hmm. because everything starts with the melody and the, and the harmon harmony, which is your mm -hmm. chord structure, right? Mm -hmm. And then all the instrumentation, everything is all it's all built up to yeah. enhance that, right? And and the way where I jump in is we you know when we there's a reason why when he started he talked about one four and five. No matter what key you're in, the one, the four, and the five are the three most important chords that you can know. And almost every other chord is based on that or is subbing in for that chord and its purpose. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's say that you're on a swing. Mm -hmm. There's three positions. There's three end positions you can be on that swing. You can be sitting like perpendicular to the ground. That's your one chord, right? That's where everything's most comfortable. You're sitting. Now, I'm gonna. Somebody, your friend comes up behind you, and he pushes you on the swing, mm -hmm. and you rise up and you get to that peak front position, right? <laughs> now, it's fun to be there. It's a nice change from where you were, mm -hmm. but there's a force that's pulling to try to bring you back to that one, right? Mm -hmm. So I call that the four chord, right? Mm -hmm. The you know the four chord. You know, let's say we're in C, right? Then I, I bring that. It's a change. It's a nice change. There's 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 a there's a tendency. It wants to eventually come back to a different chord. It doesn't want to. If I were to just do that and end the song there, it, it'll feel a little bit uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Now, your friends push you. You're up at the top of the swing. You come back past the one, and now you're on the full back swing. And you're you're sitting up there and you're seeing that ground coming and you're thinking, man, I really want to get back to my resting position because <laughs> if I fall or something, I'm going to end up on my face. It's going to be bad for everybody involved. I really want to get back. It's a nice contrast. Mm -hmm. It feels good. It was fun, but I'd really like to return. That's your five chord. Mm -hmm. So if I'm playing one, four, one, five, and I just stop there. That feels really uncomfortable. <laughs> I do this experiment with people sometimes. I'll play part of a song. I'll get to the five before the last chord, and I'll stop, and everybody will kind of just twitch and be like, got to finish the song, right? The song feels unfinished if I just land, stop on that five. Now, every other chord, and you can feel free to disagree with me on this, but every other chord is just putting on, is, is just a mask that one, four, or five is wearing. And wants to be different. So if I'm playing a song and let's say I'm doing one five, and then I play that six, that six is just one wearing a, a party mask. Mm. It's actually, you know, it's a really solid place where the song wants to be. And now let's say instead of the four, you know, I'm doing one, five, six, I play two. That two is just four wearing a mask. Mm. It's just it's just four wearing a mask. And you're just changing out different chords. Now some of those chords can fall well outside of the diatonic structure that we just talked about, you know. Right. Right? There's all sorts of now you can you can play outside of that, but they're all sort of serving one of those three purposes. And a good melody and a good harmonic structure uses those arrangements of chords intentionally for a purpose to build and release tension within the song so that if you're building to a tense point you're not going to want to use a one chord to build a tense moment you're going to want to use some chords that are based on the more colorful end of the five spectrum for example now feel free to jump in or add anything you want to that or no no exactly and i always i always i um the melody to me which is part of the scale, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's typically in that range, right? And the chords are there to support that melody, mm -hmm. right? Um, in terms of the direction that those chords go into, will be dependent on a few things. You know, mm -hmm. depending on on how that melody is progressing, and where it's where it's sitting. You know, in terms of you know within let's say the format of a song, your verse, your chorus, and, and where that melody is, that would dictate where that chord is going to sit. Mm -hmm. So in other words, sometimes that the chord fits the melody, but it doesn't sound right. 
mm. right? Because it just, it's not supposed to be there. Mm. You know, your ears telling you that if there's, there's a, just doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in, in typical Western music, right? You know, we have pro progressions. They're called chord progressions. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the one, four, five, which is typical. It's a blues uh, format. Right, we're just oh well, blues. You know, they usually have a, a seventh in there that makes mm -hmm. it sound bluesy, right? But uh, ideally, uh, just to just to demonstrate the progression, right? You get the the one, four, one, five. So that was all one, four, five. Right. But, you know, because it's got that other note in there, it makes it sound bluesy. Right. So that's 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 a progression that has been used over and over again. Right. Another progression that has been used is the one, six to five. It's another chord progression. Right. So that all. Sorry, yeah, I so, so that. All I did there is played all the white notes, mm -hmm. you know, all those notes that fall into that scale of C, you know, the C, the one, the six minor, the four, and the five. And you've heard that yes. chord progression, mm -hmm. you know, 50s and 60s music was all one, six, two, five, right? There, there's, a great, there's a great video on the internet somewhere on YouTube where it's a, it's a comedy group and yeah, they talk about every song one yeah. five six four. Yes, yeah. yes. And they go through about fifty to sixty yeah. popular songs, yeah, yeah, yeah. one <laughs> after the other, <laughs> just singing that progression yeah. over and That's over true. again. Mm -hmm. But you know, they disguise it, right? They yeah. disguise it with the, there's so many other elements that play out that mm -hmm. you almost don't necessarily hear mm -hmm. it too much. It's mm -hmm. not so obvious, but they've mm -hmm. they color it with the, the instrumentation, the melody, all those things play out. But fundamentally, mm -hmm. it's still that. That, that chord progression, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That that last per chord progression, English, well, that so word, yeah. <laughs> that last chord progression, that, that was like, I know that one. When I was a little kid, that was the one that I was taught when I was a little child, was sitting with my cousins and they would be playing these chords and it always in, in that, that type of progression. Yeah. And then they'd play a melody on top of that, right? Which was it was just interesting, and I think that got embedded into my like into me to the point that every time I play a song now, I'm using those particular chords. Yeah. And yeah. then I, another one that's really everybody knows is the, the is the one two three four right. Ah uh, yes. Right. That's all it is is one two three and four. Right. Yes. It's all it's all it all falls into that same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Diatonic. Mm -hmm. um, so, so to expand on a point he said before, when he uses the word simplistic, that's not a bad thing. No, mm -hmm. that's not because I, I want to dissuade anybody that might be thinking, oh, like I'm going to master these simple things and then I'm going to graduate from this simplistic <laughs> way of playing into this better and more advanced, complex way of playing. That's not how that works, mm -hmm. right? Some of the again, some of the greatest, catchiest, most memorable songs on planet Earth have used this simple formula, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. true. It's true. It's true. I use the word simple because I'm just mm -hmm. using the the visualize the visual aspect of, let's say, the piano yeah. and how I can just look at the notes there. Yeah. And it's simple mm -hmm. because it's just. And, and there's like this. Yeah, yeah. and there's a reason why that is one of the first songs that somebody learning how to play the piano sure. will learn yeah. how to play. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Exactly. yeah. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> One, six, two, five. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's right there. Yeah. So those are all chord progressions. Right? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So when you're writing, you keep in mind that how simple and how complex your song is is going to determine how narrow or how wide a variety of people are going to be able to play that back. So if you want to write a song that a billion people are going to listen to, it's a really good idea to use this form of writing, mm. right? If you want to write, you know, the world's greatest out of diatonic piece, there's going to be a smaller group of people that will really, really enjoy it, but it's going to cut some other people that might otherwise who don't understand it or aren't into that out. 
Right. Right. And I think I think the the the, generally speaking, the people who are listening in Mm -hmm. are, you know, they're they're more from they're approaching things more from the pop Mm -hmm. commercial um, or worship music. You know, Mm -hmm. and it all sort of falls into that category. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not, let's say, outside outside of the the norm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and and you raise a great point because I I think of even the songs that we listen like on praise and worship and uh, whether we sing it at church or where we listen on the radio, I'm sure there are a lot of songs that have a similar chord progression, or they use the same chords, maybe in different orders, but they use the same chords chords. And I'm thinking of a commercial right now where someone's talking about teaching piano it's like if you know these four chords mm-hmm. you're going to know 100 songs right. and they demonstrate it by playing these chords in a simpler, sim, sim, similar progression and start singing all these different this is all secular songs but all these secular songs but just changing the rhythm now i know i didn't say we're going to talk about rhythm and all that but i think that also is some of the things that make a difference too is when you're playing these chords or even playing these notes um the rhythm or the is rhythm the right word well rhythm has to be part of a melody right right because if you're singing a melody that melody takes place over a period of time and where you place those notes in that mm-hmm. sequence of time mm-hmm. can make or break your song absolutely yes. right so if we're if we're singing and you're you're bunching all your words together and running them really 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 fast and but without people giving somebody an opportunity to breathe in the middle of your of your long verse, mm-hmm. you know, that's going to make it less accessible. Yeah. Right. But if you're, if you're, you know, when you're writing your song, you want to make sure you're writing in times that you can breathe at a minimum in terms of what you're creating a, a melody for, right. assuming that you're writing a song for a, a, a vocal or an instrument that requires air. Yes. Right. That's very important. I play saxophone, right? Mm-hmm. It's, so I can, my saxophone playing is limited somewhat in what I, you know, what a vocalist can mm-hmm. sing in terms of having to take those points for breath. Mm-hmm. Somebody who's playing a violin or something might not have that issue, but mm-hmm. then you're writing for a different group of people. Mm-hmm. And, and it's great to note that if you have that progression with simple things like adjusting rhythm, um, syncopation, and maybe even um, the time structure of the, the chord progressions, you can take one chord progression and use it repeatedly over and over again, but just changing those little nuances and diversify your actual playing and make the song not so mm-hmm. repetitive. Mm-hmm. So here, here's an example I was playing around with in the car on my way here. So I was thinking about how you can even take the same notes, but depending on where you pitch them, mm-hmm. same rhythm mm-hmm. is going to change the feel. So if I'm, I'm going to I'm going to play a chord. It's going to be, we're going to say one over five because I've got one in my right hand and I've got five in my left hand, right? And if I see like, uh, somehow, somewhere, somehow, somewhere, right? It's not only does it change the feel, but it also almost changes the genre as Mm -hmm. well. Like if you were to listen to each of those examples, you might think of a completely different genre of music. So first one, I'm thinking maybe like just some sort of like simple pop song of somehow, somewhere. But then I start throwing in the same notes, but with different intervals. And what an interval is, is just the the measured distance between two notes. So in this bottom example, somehow, I've got a third, somehow, somewhere. Uh, for example, I'm I'm what I'm inverting the interval, I'm turning it inside out, and I'm turning it into sixths. I'm going somehow, somewhere, and all of a sudden, that larger gap in the melody creates a much heavier intensity mm-hmm. <coughs> where it's sitting. So yeah. even just something as simple as hey, I'm going to change what octave I put my notes in, yes. can change the the feel of a song. Mm-hmm. That's true, and change the melody. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. That's I just want to add another thing. Um, the the type of music that we're talking about here is, I think, as far as genre wise, is is mostly commercial based. Mm-hmm. I think you know the, we're applying some of this, some of these concepts in a commercial uh, approach because if you can deviate from that and go really mm-hmm. outside of that and now it becomes you know 
something that the majority of the people may not appreciate because mm. they don't understand it out of the comfort say, zone right? or whatever yeah so yeah. so we're we're working right now with everything we're saying we're working within um a a say a pop um even classical type of approach um where people can can understand it it's mm -hmm. not like the, it, the, it registers their ear Mm -hmm. It's not something that is so out there that they 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 don't. It's not that it's not great music. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's not palatable, let's just say, for what they're used to right. listening to. And a lot of the songs that they're going to be bringing, let's say, for myself, you know, to mm -hmm. to arrange and compose, would fall into that sort of pop genre, mm -hmm. which they're bring, they're they're providing that kind of music because that's what they're used to listening to yeah. Yeah. and if all they listen to yeah. was let's say classical or jazz then their ears totally tuned into that mm -hmm. and so that's what they would be bringing right? so mm -hmm. a, a genre by definition in order to have a genre <laughs> of music there has to be elements of that music that make it recognizable and allow you to to assess or critically analyze a piece and place it into that genre or out of that genre mm -hmm. or on a spec spectrum in between. Mm -hmm. What that means is that if you're writing a song and you're, let's say, let's say you're a worship leader and you're writing a song to, you know, be in the worship for lack of a better word industry, mm -hmm. right? If you're writing to people that are used to listening to worship music, they're used to having a set of expectations for what that song is going to include an instance we're talking about chord progressions mm -hmm. so most of the time let's say i'm, I'm picking a <clears throat> let's make, make a simple worship song i'm going to use that those chord progressions those diatonic chord progressions that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that you can't write outside of that but if you're going to go against convention mm -hmm. do so intentionally and know why you're doing it so for example, if I'm doing a, let's say I'm just doing basic, let's say one, five, six, four again, right? One, five, six, four. Now let's say I want to break convention. So I'm going to do that one, five. At this point, having played one and five, most people listening, even people that don't understand anything about music theory, there's a part of their brain that's expecting that next chord to be six. Mm -hmm. Or maybe something similar like, if I'm, it might be a two, for example, right? So if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna play one five, flat six, flat two, and back to one, I, I'm not gonna do it just because I think it sounds cool. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it if there's something about my song. For example, let's say the lyrics have have something to do with. Okay, it's a worship song. Let's say something to do with fighting back the enemy or something like that, mm -hmm. right? If if my lyrics and the purpose of my song, I want to emphasize the meaning of the lyrics that have to do with conflict, I might choose to add some conflict in my chord choice by doing that, <coughs> that little extra chord before going back to there. And I'm I'm using I'm stepping outside for a purpose mm -hmm. and not just because it feels good to me so that's why <clears throat> listening is important because the more you listen to something the more you begin to understand even on a subconscious level mm -hmm. what the progressions are and what the conventions are and then you start to feel like so i play that and i play this chord outside like ooh, that feels different i, I get this sort of reaction to it even when i'm listening to stuff on well, i don't listen to the radio if i'm Say I go to let's say I go visit another church service and I'm listening to their worship leader and they're playing a song and then I hear a chord I'm not used to I go oh mm -hmm. right and it, it makes me stop and think about what's going on it pulls me out of that zone that I'm in now that could be a good thing the worship leader might be intentionally doing that to get my attention to draw my attention to some ask the song or the lyric or the message they're trying to convey. Or it could be a bad thing. I was in this place of worship and now I just got pulled out because something broke convention. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of different things <laughs> that you can be thinking about. Don't just pick chords because you think they sound cool. Pick chords for a purpose and a reason. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so what, what you're saying is that it's done, on, it's done 
there's there's a there's a reason behind it right and then for instance if you if you just take uh, if you take a look at a uh, uh, sheet music of let's say whatever pop songs commercial based songs and you and you analyze them and you analyze the chord structure right it's very you you'll find that it falls into that category it's like it's 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 done on purpose right mm -hmm. so we're saying mm -hmm. things are done on purpose and you know from a uh, from a secular perspective what's the purpose well the purpose is to get people to like the song so they'll buy the product right mm -hmm. if they if they went outside of that it, it might discourage certain listeners thus you know, it affects the, the business side. So in other words, there's a business element that also gets played into the choice of, of uh, chords, let's just mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. that they would utilize. So mm -hmm. let's say a, you take a, an artist, for instance, and they're working with a, a composer, you know, I'm sure that they're in that relationship that there are structures. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, the he's, maybe he's being told to not do this or do that, but to do something specific because they're after um, an audience. Right. So by by choosing certain chords, um, we're talking chords at this point, mm -hmm. that um, it, it does create that you capture that audience mm -hmm. and that, mm -hmm. that audience can be insanely specific like if you're working in film trailers <clears throat> a producer will come to a composer and say i have this film that i'm making i want you to write music for this trailer that sounds similar enough to this other movie so that everybody listening it thinks that yeah. it's going to be like this other movie mm -hmm. but not so similar to it that we get sued for copyright infringement mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. so basically what you're saying is it's there's it's done there's a purpose mm -hmm. it's is there it's a, a, there's an orchestration behind the choice of um, chords so right say chords, so it's right? intentionality yeah yes, and, exactly and i think that yeah. Um, something I've experienced is that there's also a complementary aspect of the lyric with the with the music as well. We're talking like some songs would um, increase in tone or a pitch, and then the music would increase in intensity, you know, or whatever, just to, to bring that dynamic yeah. and couple that with the lyric. Yeah. And so that's what I think is what you're yeah, so it's talking intentional. about. There's yeah. a, there is a, a purpose um, uh, that, that goes with why, mm -hmm. or it's not just you know throwing the bunch of chords in there to make it sound you know cool or or right. let's say you know you you want to use certain chords because you know you're you like jazz and you feel that you know that's a cool chord to throw mm -hmm. in there right mm -hmm. you know it's like well it doesn't really maybe it doesn't need it <laughs> it's just your ego talking there yeah. <laughs> and again it's it's again it comes down to why are you writing this yeah, song exactly. if you're writing these songs because you want to become a, a, a hit or a professional songwriter or you want to make it in the industry for lack of a better word is, mm -hmm. then you need to you need to study these conventions so that you know them so that you can write within them so that you can intentionally break them when necessary mm -hmm. if you're writing music because you want to create a piece of art then you can write whatever chords you want to make the art look like whatever you want mm -hmm. Okay. And that's actually a good study as well mm -hmm. for somebody to take, let's say, just pick, you know, five tunes, mm -hmm. let, let's say in, in the um, praise and worship genre, let's just say, pick five tunes. And if you can get a hold of the music, analyze the structure and mm -hmm. see how, you know, one chord moves into the other chord. If you got a sheet music, it usually has the melody. And then you got the chord, mm -hmm. and then you can mm -hmm. try to figure out, okay, how this is all working out, how they've created that progression, right? And that's also a good study. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's something we haven't even touched on. We're talking about notes, progressions, chords, and all that. We haven't talked about sounds and the different voices you give those sounds for that. That adds a whole different dynamic to the chords themselves and the feel, the texture. Uh, so, I mean, there's so many other tools besides the the structure of yeah the so we're talking we're talking yeah. the, the the foundation exactly. here exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like when you when you when you submit a song so can you're submitting uh, a melody and that's what you're submitting right like you can copyright the melody and the lyrics mm -hmm. you can't copyright 
as a song the harmonic progression. You can copyright an arrangement of a melody, and that's where you include things like the instrumentation, the, the harmonic structure, etc. But if you're copywriting a song, a song is by definition, according to SOCAN, mm -hmm. lyrics and melody put together. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, within, and we haven't even, aside from like maybe one or two points, we haven't even just, just, you can spend so much time just on breaking down what to do with the melody, right. what to do with those those things in sequence. But I think that most people watching, they already have an idea of what that melody should be like in their head. I think that comes naturally to a lot of people. A lot of people learn how to sing and hum, hum tunes in and, you know, there are certain tweaks that you can do to make it more accessible. And that's, that's another thing. I went and just as a kick, I went and looked up the top 100 CCLI songs, the top 100 worship songs right now, 84 of them were co-authored projects. Mm. There were only 16 out of the top 100 that were written by a single person. Wow. So one, one great thing that you can do to get, you know, we talk about listening to get better ideas from, from the music that you're listening to, but also if you find some other songwriters in your area and you guys can meet up with and bounce ideas off of each other, you're going to have access to a whole nother person's sound library in their head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can spend all that time listening, or you can find somebody else that's already spent all that time listening to some music completely different from you, and you have access to 10 years of musical vocabulary inside somebody else's head just exactly. from starting a conversation with someone. That's true. Mm -hmm. I haven't listened to the same songs that he has. I could probably learn a whole bunch if I spent a whole day with him. I could probably make a lot of songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was just thinking as well that, um, the concept of originality, right? Like a songwriter who comes up with a song, they they see themselves, this is my song. I wrote this song, right? But all all we're all influenced. Mm -hmm. So we're all getting something from something, right? And so when you come up with a song, you know, if you listen carefully, you'll probably hear something that from somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know? it's not exactly the same I and mean, there's so many songs that have been written on purpose so they basically will take because there was a let's say a song was very successful so they'll take portions of that hide it in such a way to to disguise it but um for the for a purpose again to to create um a listening audience you know obviously so so you're taking something that somebody else wrote and now you're putting your own spin on it so the idea of originality is you know it's kind of uh we're we're all a mix of something mm -hmm. because of because of our influence right well, i can see that intentionality because you see it works already i'm going to utilize that for the demograph exactly. and i'm going to see yeah. if i can do that yeah mm -hmm. it, it takes it. a long time <clears throat> and a lot of practice to move from a place of where your songs will begin to stop sounding like a so compilation of other artists work mm -hmm. and eventually you'll get to your own sound and that's okay that's part of the process mm -hmm. when i when I, I there's this myth i want to dispel and that this myth is that some people are inherently born talented for doing this mm -hmm. and there are some people that aren't and it's like, I have this gift and that gift should be enough to make me famous or make me good or whatever, right? If we talk about musical prodigies, for example, the phrase musical prodigy, when you think of music prodigy, what's like the first name that comes to your mind in history? Beethoven. Uh, Beethoven, <laughs> that, that could be one. But the one that I think about is Mozart. Mozart, Mozart, Mozart yes, wrote something sure. like 490 something symphonies, mm. right? I was like, oh man, Mozart was so gifted. Well, let's hold on a moment. I want to bring up two points. First of all, Mozart started full-time music training when he was like, like before he could speak almost. Wow. He wrote his first symphony when he was five. And he, you know, and he, he tragically, he passed away in his early thirties. But the second point I want to raise is that the first, I think 200, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get the exact number right, but something like the first 209 symphonies that he wrote, critics deemed as derivative unoriginal works and it wasn't until he got to something like symphony 212 where the critics then began to say this is a great original piece of work now i don't know about you but if i and and school back then wasn't the same as school now it's not like mozart was going to school and learning about english mm -hmm. 
and history and math and all this stuff. Mozart was full time music studying from the age of at least as early as five onwards. Now, if I spent eight to 12 hours a day for a lot of years mm -hmm. and I wrote 200 symphonies, I bet you by the time that I got to Symphony 201, mm -hmm. I might be getting pretty good at it. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Just maybe. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, some people that will take more work and more time than others. But if it's something you really want to do and you're willing to put the time in it and you're willing to put the work into it and you're willing to be patient with the process and put up with your first songs sounding like <clears throat> derivatives of the stuff that you're listening to mm -hmm. and fight through that until you get to the point where you're producing work that sounds original, I guarantee you that you can do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you have to be patient. That's and you have to I'm practice yes. and write, 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 write. Even if it sounds bad to you, don't, don't care. Just keep writing until it stops sounding bad to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, That's a really good point. And I really appreciate that because, you know, how many of us have been writing songs and we go, oh, that's awful. I'll just parry that one. And, and it maybe it is when we, when we start out, it maybe is a derivative. I mean, we've talked about it on, on previous shows that sometimes people start writing music just based on hearing a song or a tune that they've liked and they say, and, and they're told, okay, now take that tune, put your own words to it. Now sing your words to that tune. Okay. Now see if you can do a little derivative or something a little different with that tune. And it's like a, this little building process mm -hmm. to try and work towards originality mm -hmm. but it's based on a tune that they've heard and they've liked I we mean, only do this with art only with art like if if, <laughs> if i went to if, if i went to someone who says like you're going to be a surgeon you're going to be a great surgeon <laughs> here's a patient <laughs> he needs his kidney out let's go <laughs> everybody will look at me like a crazy no that surgeon has to go to school <clears> for <throat> a decade that's, that's and right. practice on hundreds and hundreds of not living human bodies did i say that okay yes, that before that's they're even considered you know close to getting but we we somehow ex even in sports right nobody goes and says like to this 12 year old kid hey you're a great you're a great baseball player here i'm gonna put you in front of clayton kershaw hit a home run for me right no. nobody's gonna do that there's an expectation of a process they have to go through but for some reason when it comes to society especially when it comes to worship music someone says oh you're really gifted hmm. come do this professional thing that takes a lot of people years of study and we're going to expect you to be just as good as people that have done that without that mm -hmm. we we put that same level of expectation without putting also the expectation <clears throat> of the amount of work and time that's going to go into it mm -hmm. now it's fun mm -hmm. once you understand it all it's it's great mm -hmm. but there's work mm -hmm. involved in it and there's practice involved in it that's right when I was in college, my, my teacher told me that I had to practice 14 hours a day. And I told him, it's like, I have a job. And he's like, then you practice eight hours a day. Better yet, get a job playing on a cruise ship or something where you have to play. Right? And <laughs> that's what he told me. I mean, the irony. Yeah, that's it. Well, I think, I think partly there's a, I mean, let's say Hollywood, let's say, they really create this illusion of, you know, musicians and all of a sudden shows up on the stage and he right i don't know where i don't know where any yeah. plays yeah. amazing or sings it's amazing true. right and so that gets that gets uh um the audience the people who don't understand they just pick up on that i mean you've seen it on the whole american idol thing you know these guys these people that think they can sing because maybe their family members tell me you are a great singer you should go on and you've seen some of the yeah, some of the horrors the, so yeah. they're funny but but they actually believe that they can do it mm -hmm. right. right but it's an illusion right mm -hmm. because it's it's the kind of it gets painted that way mm -hmm. and people don't realize too that the great songs that have made it those songs went through a process let's say let's say the craftsmanship of the even the lyric writing Mm -hmm. Some of these uh, lyrics, the lyrics have been modified, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they, they, they started off with, you know, what, what came to them, but I'm pretty sure a lot of these big hits, let's just say, they've been, they've gone through, you know, the, the drawing board yeah, many right. times, 
especially if, if they're it's a co-writing, you know, and, and they come up with this, come with that, and then they, and that's just the lyrical part. Then there's also the, the melodic part, and then there's the music part. So th they've gone through a process, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, and I think I've run into situations in the past where I've had, let's say, uh, Christians who, you know, they came up with a song and they really felt that it was divine, you know, and so they bring the song and I can tell that the song needs some structure, needs to be fixed, but they don't want to touch it because they feel that it's divine, right? But I'm thinking, yeah, but it still needs, there's still a craft that goes with the, um, the final when it's said and done, right? Because there's, there's different elements, right? The idea may have been divine. <laughs> yes, exactly. That may have been a good idea. Yeah. But it needs to be refined. Exactly. Right? You know, and, and this is, this, this is going to sound a lot worse than it is, but you go into a songwriting circle, almost all song ideas are bad. Mm. That doesn't mean that you're a bad songwriter, but part of it's a numbers game. You got, if you, if you're aware that you're going to, that nine out of 10 of your song ideas are going to be bad. It means that one out of 10 of your song ideas are going to be good. So what is, what is the most successful mindset to apply to that? I need to get as many of my song ideas out of me into a form that I can get feedback on as possible. The faster I can get to that 10th song each time, mm -hmm. the faster that I'm going to be able to write good songs. Mm -hmm. right. And that's why it's important for songwriters to write <clears throat> and write and how'd, then write. How did you get better at reading? <laughs> exactly. You have yeah. to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if, if, if you want to aspire to be a songwriter, then just do it. So there, like yeah. I said, there's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a skill set, yeah. right? I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of one, you know, one of the great songs was "Lady, Did You, Baby, um, How's It Going, Mary, Did You Know?" Yes. That if you listen to the word on that, the, just the way it all comes together, oh, yeah. I'm sure that that song. I don't know the history of it, but I'm sure that that song was crafted. Yeah. I can also tell you the guy that wrote that can't read music. Mm. But he could tell a good Mark joke. Lowry. Right. <laughs> he could tell a good joke, though. Yeah. He's a great comedian. But he was also part of, like, probably one of the greatest oh, community yes. of songwriters on the planet. True. Right? So he can't read music, <coughs> but he's connected with people that oh, yeah. can. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And he's part of a network and a group of, of, of songwriters that if he needs an idea, he can go to totally. anybody. Absolutely. He can pick up the phone and call 50 people that can that can help help him with his song. Yep. Yeah, so Absolutely. that's a good example of a, a mm -hmm. song that is just, just it, every it word from every sentence mm -hmm. just yeah. it just makes so much sense and it yeah. just flows yeah, it paints perfectly. a picture as well. Yeah. So it's, you know, yeah. I don't know the history, but I'm mm -hmm. sure that that there are, that that song went through many different stages mm -hmm. until it reached this is it. You know. Yeah. You know, and and when you think about all these these elements that we're talking about right now one of the things that i'm picking up too is that all of these elements put together can take a, a listener on a journey and that's part of the reason why people are writing songs too it's to tell a story mm -hmm. or to take them on a journey mm -hmm. or both mm -hmm. right and um and how they do that is through the use of different melodies different chords different chord yeah. progressions because I mean, you kind of alluded to it a little. I think you said, Anthony, <clears throat> that sometimes when the purpose of writing the song is to encourage a certain response from the listeners or to attract certain listeners, um, uh, it, it's almost like, and, and I was going to ask about this, are, is there like core progressions that, that would solicit certain responses, if that makes any sense? So I'll use, it, I'll, do you know what I'm trying to say? It's, Anthony? It's difficult to give you a, a, a completely objective answer about that mm. simply because there are different cultures. So, for example, in Western culture, you the what basically is an aesthetically pleasing interval is that major chord or that major triad, right? Mm. That's what we view as beautiful and consonant sound. You go to the rural hills of Bulgaria and that suddenly their music, their consonant sound is the major second. So... And then you go to some other regions and you go to India and they use a 22 tone scale, which means that I have to add red keys to my keyboard. And all of a sudden I'm taking out completely, but for the purposes of Western art music, 
the general convention is major happy and minor sad. Now there are variations within that, but basically the more, the, the closer you are to that one, that major sound, right? You know, is sort of open and happy. You can create tension by going to those, you know, in, in a diatonic sense, I can go to um, a five or a, or a seven chord, mm -hmm. right? Using those diminished and I'm, you know, getting into, I'm, now I'm out of the diatonic, but you can create tension by breaking convention. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going, right, now all of a sudden I'm out, I'm, I've, I'm outside of the convention of popular <clears throat> worship music, but I'm entering and playing within the convention of more black gospel. If I, you know, go down, right, I'm still within there. So to answer, to, to try to answer your question without going on this random side tangent, <laughs> if you're going to write a song and you ask yourself, what do I want my listener to feel? Mm -hmm. Or what do I want my listener to do when I write this song? You get the answer to that question. You go, okay, what do I need to do musically to have that? So if I want my listener to feel tense, mm -hmm. there are chords and chord progressions that I can choose that will more likely do that. You know, tense, diminished chords. You know. Nice little tension there. There are chords that are less likely to do that. Not as tense. Mm -hmm. So you can help your listener feel what you want them to feel by choosing appropriate <coughs> chords. Mm -hmm. Is there a specific, you can feel yeah, free yeah, to yeah, add yeah, that yeah, I feel yeah, like yeah. I'm rambling a bit. No, no, so. no. So, and to add to that, it's it's like, you're right. Who, who, who are you? you re, so you got this song idea start starts that way right you got, you got a melody and in your in your mind you're probably thinking okay i i i want to i want to i want to there's a reason you want to do this to start with right yeah. why right is it just for yourself maybe so a lot of people do that mm -hmm. you know they just they feel like they just want to give birth to this idea right for whatever reason right or some people have more of an objective perspective like they want to use it for uh in, within let's say within the the christian community to um worship mm -hmm. and to uh to inspire mm -hmm. others mm -hmm. right what i find most christian artists that's, i think that's their main purpose really is mm -hmm. to inspire and uh then going for, further into that then it's a question of okay so you know what style am i going to write this in and what kind of core, what kind of harmony yeah. i'm going to use with within do i want to stay within you know sort of sort of let's say country music which is very sort of diatonic very mm -hmm. very one four five two you know some 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 exceptions but typically it's in that genre and you know it because as soon as you hear it you know it you know because of the the uh, the courting that that goes mm -hmm. into it and uh, and the melody how adult plays into the courting right but then you know you might want to go further into let's say some of the pop music and there's pop music that have that has ja jazz elements in it mm -hmm. right mm -hmm they're slight mm -hmm. they don't go too deep into it because they don't want to uh, uh, discourage too many listeners but they still keep it within um within like for instance if you take a simple tune like uh, over the rainbow right mm -hmm. uh, you can go very simple right <laughs> right or you can go like that mm. right but some people want the other version because it's simple so, right so <laughs> to take that concept so if i'm you know as a worship leader i have to keep in mind the congregation that i'm playing for mm -hmm. so for example like i used to be a music director at a at a church that was you know <laughs> multicultural but predominantly black mm -hmm. 
So their window for where they're going to feel bored versus where they're going to feel things are too tense is really tilted heavily towards having to play really heavily outside of the diatonic structure or really, you know, uh, words have left my brain, uh, <laughs> syncopate, heavy syncopation and stuff to, to get that. So if I want to el elicit some sort of tension response, I've got to push really, really hard mm -hmm. into that tension window musically to get that response because their music that they grew up with culturally and got used to hearing was heavily tilted towards that side. Now, if I walk into a country white church, for lack of a better word, that's just that's just re the reality of music, right? And I take that that heavy, tense, syncopated, dissonant chord progressions, and I go and I play them at this other more traditional church, I'm going to send them running out of the room. Because their idea of what constitutes consonant relaxative music versus what constitutes dissonant tense music, that window is, is tilted way towards consonant side. In fact, in the Catholic Church back in the 15th, 16th century, this interval was banned. And because, and it was called the devil's tone, and that if you played that, the tritone? you get, yeah, the tritone, yeah. right? You play that, you, you, you were going to get, they were not going to treat you very well. Right. Mm -hmm. So culture, you have to, again, understanding who are you writing for? Mm -hmm. And don't just say I'm writing for everybody. That is a cop out. Mm -hmm. Pick a group of people that you're writing for or playing for. Mm -hmm. Just as you said, because when you were playing your somewhere over the rainbow example, right, you could hear, you could almost see the two different groups of people that were each going to appreciate that differently. Because mm -hmm. there's a group of people that's going to really appreciate and be moved by the first one that the second one is it's not going to do anything for them. Mm. And then there's a group of people that are going to be really touched by the second one and send the first group running. Mm -hmm. And you know, is it, you know, look now and let's, let me throw this in right from a spiritual perspective now, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got, let's say two styles and both are well done. Mm -hmm. Okay. But let's say they're both pro. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you've got you know, a congregation. And you play one style, and uh, let's say it doesn't necessarily fit. Mm -hmm. It's almost like okay, does does the spiritual side of things play into the the uh, the style of music? You know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. Like in how the style of music is actually will will actually dictate how well people will receive the uh let's say the message or whatever is going to come afterwards right how the style actually plays itself out and and like i said both can be done very well and professional but depending on the recipient mm -hmm. and how they receive it and, and i'm talking from a spiritual side of things because you're going to say okay well you know god loves all music right mm -hmm. so why can't you just play that kind of music for any kind of crowd mm -hmm. as you can see that the the receiving end uh, may not be as receptive sure right the, so, so the style actually cultural played, normatives yes exactly. and how the, the style yep. the the we're talking chords and all mm -hmm. that sorts and how that all plays out on how people receive mm -hmm. right yeah and again that the music can actually just as much as you can write music that will assist you in your purpose, you can write music that will hinder you in That's your right. purpose. Mm -hmm. So, for example, let's say that I'm writing a song that wants to put the gospel message out there. So I want to put, I want to put the gospel message to music. Mm -hmm. Now, if I, if I take that gospel message and I put it in screaming and I set it to some very, very heavy thrash metal, mm -hmm. right? I am hindering most of my listeners' ability mm -hmm. to hear that message and respond to it. Everybody that's not a metalhead mm -hmm. is going to be wondering what the heck I'm saying. And everybody that is, is going to be too busy feeling the beat and the rhythm and the pulse of the music mm -hmm. in order to uh, and be responding to the rhythm and not the melody and the message. Mm -hmm. This is why taking secular music that's popular and setting Christian lyrics to it, in my opinion, disclaimer, doesn't really work. Because 
lyrically, the message is clear, but musically and mentally, as soon as they hear that secular song, their mind is way back where that message, where that old message is. The music has already carried the message <clears throat> beforehand, and therefore it's coming against your ability to bring that message along. So I encourage people, if you're going to get into songwriting, you want to write songs, you know, develop your original voice and develop your originality so that you can write music to assist you in what you're trying to accomplish. Mm. Wait, it was it wasn't that, you know, years ago that the choice instrument was the organ. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. <laughs> and how the organ was the spiritual instrument. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now it's pads. It's pads. Yeah. pads. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, this, uh, I'll, I will say this, like, I, I don't know about you, Dale. I've learned quite a lot with these guys. I yeah. mean, mm -hmm. from, and, and, you know, learning these elements um, really is a way of expanding. I, mean, I know I said it earlier. It's really a way of expanding and understanding of how music actually works, you know, and, 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 and the power behind it. I, I wanted to, I'm glad you talked about gospel music because I was going to just say this, what we've been basically talking about when I talk about gospel music, I always say gospel, gospel is the message and the message is the gift and how it is wrapped musically is, is basically the different genres of music that we we've kind of touched on the pop, the jazz or whatever, but it's, that's just the wrapping. What we've been talking about today are the elements of the wrapping. Mm -hmm. Really, it's like we've talked about the paper. We've talked about the we've talked about the ribbon. We've talked about the, you know, how to put it all together. We've talked about the tape. We talked about all of this, based on the chords, the scales, the the uh, the progressions, and how they can be used to develop tension, right. or to develop happiness or sadness or whatever. That's literally what we've done. Yes. We've talked about the wrapping paper, yeah, the, right? The presentation is just that, that's all. That's right. Yeah. And and true to what you said, John, sometimes the wrapping paper um, appeals to a certain group and, and causes another group to say, no, I'm not interested in that, right? And, and thus it is important to understand who your audience is and who do you want to write to and good point as well that was raised was know who you want to write to mm -hmm. even if you're saying you want to write to everybody still have a target because everyone else who could be interested but who's your target if you want to target youth for example and you want to do music that appeals to them which will probably be more rap, I guess, <laughs> right? But, you know, but anyway, we, that's a whole different thing. But, you know, if you're, you're doing music that more appeals to them or music that appeals to people that maybe like the country Southern gospel sound or people that like uh, the jazz sound, um, target those people. There may be other people that will just tune in and accept the challenge that was given at the beginning, listening to other styles of music that will kind of stretch your ability to um, apply that creativity to your songs. Yeah, and I also just to touch on something, I don't want to make you realize that authenticity is important too. Yes. You know, because we're, we're talking about finding a niche or a demograph and playing for them, but be authentic about it. That's right. You know, you, you can't be dis disingenuous when it comes to music because people will see right through it. That's right. That's right. So and, I... And if I can add one, one yeah. little yes. thing to that, what you just said about being authentic. Mm -hmm. Also being professional about mm -hmm. it as well, because mm -hmm. that also plays out because mm -hmm. you can have all the authenticity. Um, but, you know, if you if you if you haven't developed, if you haven't put the time in and then it's not going to up really um unless, unless you're just doing for yourself right, right. Mm -hmm. but it's not going to really reach the people that you're trying to reach you know if within let's say the spiritual context of the gospel gospel music right mm -hmm. ultimately it's because you want to use it as a tool mm -hmm. right that if it's not done properly then you're not going to achieve mm -hmm. you know, what your goal is right right to lean into that a bit that's talking about um you, you don't want to be a distraction you want to do it properly. You want to do it well. Yeah. And I think that's to... part of being authentic yeah. too. I yes. Think, right? right. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Well, we're just 
great that uh, grateful you've joined us for this conversation. It's been, um, I think, stretching in some ways, and maybe in other ways, it's been really educational. So um, I want to thank you for watching. And if you have not already done so, please don't forget to subscribe and like this video, hit the notification bell on our YouTube channel. And please drop us a little, you know, comment. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, to know more about what we're doing, please visit us on our website, gmihub.ca. You can find out all about us there. New things going on all the time. We've got a support page now, which is really encouraging for people to say, how can we support what you're doing? And Well, gmihub.ca, you go into support and you can find out many ways which you can support us and what we're doing here. And we thank you ahead of time for that. And also... Um, we just want to remind Ron all the time. Our YouTube channel is full of different videos, and uh, so check it out. And our next um, big one coming up in January. January. January twelfth. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be amazing. You want to join join us on that for sure. Absolutely. So I want to say thanks to our panelists for Anthony and for Jonathan. Thank you so much for coming and being with us today and sharing your knowledge. I mean, it's exciting. I have a feeling we're going to have some conversations even after this. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and um, our next, oh, I don't know if I should announce it. <laughs> um, we are planning another artist showcase in the new year. So stay tuned for that. And we want to continue this conversation in the new year as well. And I'd like to get your feedback about how this was for you in terms of knowledge and if you have any questions i'm sure we can send it to these guys and they'd be very happy to respond um as well mm -hmm. so yeah without so again thank you guys yes thank and you john dale's already thank thanked you. all of you for awesome. watching yes the kids are awesome is that what you said? Uh, these guys are awesome oh i thought it said the kids <laughs> the kids are awesome your, like, well, your, your kids are not half that asleep <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you for joining us. God bless you. Take care. Until next time. And have a great holiday. Happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas. <laughs> Until then. Bye, -bye. Bye for now. <laughs> Bye.